Yet again this week, um, thinking about the events of the week, and not only not only the tragic events in Manchester, but also the uh, the events of the uh, remembering the ascension and and all that, and thinking towards Pentecost. And I'm thinking again, as I often do. Well, we're doing John's Gospel, but we better just um, break with that and do what we need to do this week. And I'm wrong again, as always, on that. Just give you three, uh, two verses actually, three verses. John 7, 37. Um, Jesus has continued at the festival of shelters and uh, there's an awful lot of whinging and moaning and argy-bargy with the, with the Jews. And they just go through it again and they just don't get it. And uh, who's Jesus? We know where he comes from. He can't come from heaven because he's come from Nazareth and all that stuff. Then we read in verse 37. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Whoever is thirsty should come to me and drink. As the scripture says, Whoever believes in me, streams of life-giving water will pour out from his heart. And Jesus said this about the Spirit, which those who believe in him were going to receive. At that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus had not been raised to glory. I think it's good that you will have all seen uh, in the media this week, and it's good to reflect on all that happened uh, in Manchester and how they are dealing with it, and the sadness and the pain. And today's media puts it right there, in your living room, doesn't it? And some of you will have experienced things of some sort in some way and will resonate with that. I think it's a hugely important event, um, partly because it brings, it brings the whole um, terrorism, sadness, brokenness, death thing um, closer to us. We know that this week all those cops were, were simply gunned down in Egypt, but it's a long way away. But Manchester is a lot nearer. It brings, and the sufferings, how many children have died in Syria in this last week. But that's Syria. But it brings it near it, brings it to our attention, doesn't it? And represents the sufferings of a, a wider world. But it's also because it's a big event, it brings to our attention things that would occur in microcosm. People have died in our, in our community this week. There have been funerals, there have been tragedies, there have been disasters, there have been families in, in bits. But that is smaller, that is more local, but it is more manageable perhaps, but not for them. And so a big event like this brings into focus... All of that sort of thing. From far away it brings it nearer. From small it brings it to large. And it brings it into focus for each one of us. So I, that's really important. Isn't it? That's important that we respond to it in a way that Jesus would respond. God stands there amongst them and weeps with them. And it's important that the Christians there are at the forefront of caring and opening uh, opening church halls and praying for people and uh, holding memorial services and holding collections for people, helping people. And the Christians should be in the forefront, and I'm sure they are, and we need to support them in our prayers. We also need to be doing that in our, in where, it, where it touches us in normal um, bereavement and death and crisis in people we know. We need to be doing that. I just wonder whether, however, the church and the Christian community need to do a little bit more than what it normally does. It comes and it has special services and it light candles and it prays prayers and it is in the forefront of helping along with everybody else. I wonder really what the gospel is not saying. That is not, that's good, that's, that's important, but perhaps there is something slightly more radical here. If you look at the way that... Um, the, the people of Manchester, in a broad sense, have coped with this. They are coping with it in a way that was coped in, in London earlier on, with, it, with the bombings there and in, and in Paris. There's a common, some common factors. Above all, there's this definitely the business of standing together, the huge sense of standing together. Whether it's in a public place, you literally stand together. Whether it is in sort of singing, we all stand together. 
But whether it is more than that is standing together and caring for one another. And the most extraordinary things happen, particularly early on, you know, the taxis are driving around taking people for free and people giving people free flowers and free tea and free everything. There is nothing that you could not do for one another. It is humanity at its best, particularly at the beginning. And so there's a great solidarity. There is a great sense that together we are stronger than we are alone. And that is hugely important. And I believe that God applauds that. Jesus said, after all, he who is uh, not against us is for us. This doesn't have to be a specifically religious thing. Good things are good things and God rejoices. There's also a sense um, of shared history. As soon as it came up, well, not as soon, but pretty soon, there was pictures that, of what I remember of the IRA bombings in Manchester when it was all, all the shopping centre was blown up. We've been here before and we will get through it again, sort of thing. And there is also a great sense that we would recognise of people in a disastrous situation feeling they cannot cope and they need to reach out beyond themselves. And so there is a silence, there is a waiting, there are candles, there's one sort of a prayer or another to something or someone beyond ourselves. This is all too much. This doesn't make everybody hugely religious, that would be offensive to say so, but there is a wanting to reach out to something or someone or some, something that's beyond us. Now, although it's a very different occasion, if we're looking to see what the Bible might say on this, this um, festival the Jews had, uh, the festival of tabernacles or, or booths or whatever you want to call it, has got remarkable similarities in the situation. The Jews are an embattled people. They don't have an empire anymore. They don't have a proper king anymore. They don't have much land anymore. They are, they are run by the Romans, um, and the Romans crush them in every way. Their religion is in battle because the Romans turned up with 57 other sorts of gods, and the Greeks turned up with all their gods, and there's temples all over the place, and they are in battle. They are a minority. And so when you go to these big festivals, there were two or three of these a year, this was the great celebration of the Israeli nation. This was the great celebration of bringing all those people come together and stand together. We are the Jews, this is our temple and we believe. And it was a great synergy, there was a lot of noise, a lot of celebration, a lot of jostling in, those, in the narrow streets, lots of sharedness. This is a great strength. For them, we stand together, at least at this point. We're not just stuck in some miserable little synagogue somewhere in, domest you know, in, in provincial Israel. We've come together. This is, this is as good as it gets. And on the day that Jesus stand up, this is the greatest day. This is the pinnacle. This is. But there is also a shared history because at the Feast of Tabernacles, um, they, they used to camp out in these sort of uh, little shelters to remind them of traveling across the wilderness, where we come from. We came out of Egypt. This is the land we were given. We have a shared history. We have a narrative. And clearly there is a reaching out beyond themselves. You may say very religiously, but to some extent those festivals have become a bit like a, a civic service, a national service at Westminster Abbey. It's good stuff, but it's a bit civic, you know. The Old Testament prophets often speak of God being fed up with the festivals. They reach out, but it's a, bit, it's a bit national sort of thing. And so there's a lot of similarities there. And in the midst of that, Jesus is there. And the disciples are there. And we should be there, as we are now. But in the midst of it, we have this amazing occurrence when Jesus stands up. Rabbis never stand up to speak. They sit down. He stands up. He cries out with a loud voice. Everybody needs to hear this. And he says. In other words, there is more to be said than being there, being nice, praying for people and helping them. There is more to be said. Were there not to be more to be said, Jesus would not have said it. In the midst of all of this unity and coming together and shared this and shared that, Jesus stands up and says something else because they are still thirsty. 
because there's limits to togetherness. There's limits to what the synergy of human strength can produce. There are limits to what we can do, even when we are together. There are limits to the Obama moment, yes, we can, because there's a little bracket at the bottom that says, no, we can't. There are limits to shared history, and there are limits to reaching out. And you know that because you've all tried it. And all your families have tried it in adversity. How often have I been to big community funerals with a family, with a massive, massive family in many relations. The church is full of all these people who have come together to be strengthened with one another, to stand together. People who didn't know one another for years. Parts of the family who don't like one another. All these people come together and they're all here for you. And then they tell us what they've done in history and how they did this. And they have a shared life and a shared history. And then they all stand around the grave. Those who believe and those who don't believe reaching out hopefully as they look into the hole that something's going to be there. This is what we do. And in the midst of that, Jesus says, you're still thirsty. This is good, but there is more. And he offers them. What does he offer them? He stood up and said, if any is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. And it says that that water is the water of the spirit. He offers them life. What we are confronted with in a thing like Manchester or in our own tragedies, in our own lives, is that we do not have life. And you can't get it back. And death overwhelms people. And they want life, but they can't get life. However many candles and however much space you have we mourn for life because there is death we are surrounded by death confronted by death and our loved ones are not there they are no more and that's the elephant in the room that's what really stalks the the center of manchester as it did london as it does paris they are not there but the gospel is a gospel of resurrection not a gospel of survival It's not a matter of scraping through. It is a matter of coming from death to life. We need to hear, as the people around us need to hear, that those who go before us and those who die are not gone into oblivion, but they are in God's hands. Now, we know that God will deal with some of the adults in various different ways because they'll need dealing with, but they are all in good hands. We need to hear a word of resurrection here. Death has gone. Life has come. Not only that, though, the survivors have a real sense of death. When you lose somebody or lose something and the world falls apart, you think, they think, they say, that's it. My life has come to an end as I knew it. It's very difficult to get through that. But Jesus Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life for the survivors as well. As well. And I will bring you healing. I will lead you through the power of the Spirit into forgiveness, which will be ultimate healing for you. I will give you new hope, new peace, and I will give you a new life. And that is a resurrection. It's not cheering up. It's not looking on the bright side. It's not trying to find some good circumstance. It is that he says, I give you something new. I have tried so often to reach into people, to give them a sense of resurrection. It cannot be done. But Jesus can do it. Indeed, not only does he offer life, but he offers life that starts from the heart rather than starts from circumstance. One of the terrible things, I think, about a disaster like this, and you can see it in what people say, is that they have become victims of circumstance. This has happened to me. I cannot believe it happened to me. I bought the tickets. We went to the show. We were coming back. And then we were going for a takeaway and tomorrow we were going there and at the weekend we were going in to see the big run run in the middle of Manchester. That's what we were going to do. And now something has intervened with which we have no control and is is, is broken in on us and crushed us. There's a real fear of lack of control. It's beyond us. It has crushed us. Just as we have a loved one who is seriously ill, we will do anything. What do they need to eat? What medicine do they need? Do they need us? Do they need fresh air? Do they need to be moved around? We'll buy a new car. Uh, We'll go to the hospital. We'll pay for this. We'll do anything. 
because we are still contributing. And then they die and we feel, what can you do? A great sense of being a victim. And any amount of running around and saying, we're going to help you, is still on the outside. You see, Jesus Christ begins from the inside and works out, rather than allowing the world to crush you from the outside so that it gets you on the inside. Remember, um, that's, it's watching people, I'm not good at origami, isn't it? Is that right? Origami is paper, isn't it? You sometimes get the completely wrong word with this, and it's something else, like hedge cutting or something. But, you know, origami, anyway, is, is where you do all that paper folding, isn't it? Yeah. And I remember at school, you used to be able to make water bombs. You've done this? With paper? And you can fill it all together, and you get this sort of scrunchy thing like that. And, and it, 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 it's just like a, a folded up envelope sort of thing. And then the next thing was, because it was a whole, the person would blow into it, and the whole thing would come out into a square, didn't it? This doesn't work if you haven't done that, but anyway. You go, and the thing go, like this, you see? And then you can fill it with water. But that's another story. I think that what Jesus does in a crushed life is like that with the spirit. The spirit goes into the crushed life and it reconfigures it from the inside. And all of our efforts and all of our care and all of our love is running around all the, trying to pull it out. And you can't get to people, can you? Try it. Come on, I love you. It's going to be better. We're going to get through this. But Jesus starts in the inside. It will be flowing up from his heart. It's what his people need in time. It's what we need. From the heart to life-giving water. Flowing up, he says. But we have to say that not only do we have resurrection, not does it come from a new heart, but Jesus says, come to me. If we miss that, we've got a program. Jesus is not dispensing resurrection and he's not dispensing new hearts. He is drawing people. Come, it's a, one of the best verses in John's gospel. He cried out with a loud voice, come unto me. This is a personal thing. And at the heart of everything, reaching out to God... He comes. He is not found. He finds us. And Jesus stands there amongst all those people that were looking for them, looking for him in some way, and says, I am here because you have not found me, however pietistically Jewish you are, however great this festival is. I remember many times you've washed in all these, big, um, you know, all these big tubs of water. You haven't got there, but I have come to you, and this is the gospel of Jesus in every place. That you that reach out beyond yourself, he who is beyond you comes to you and says, come to me. I'm here. I'm accessible. I love you. It's what Jesus says. I will give you a new heart. I will start in the middle. I will reconstruct you and I will forgive you and I will restore you. And I will reach those parts that no one else can reach. And indescribably, I will bring you resurrection where there is no chance. And then it will spread out into everything else. I have never been to one of these parties, but I'm sure you have been to one of these parties, where one of the party tricks is to have a pyramid of champagne glasses. And many of you have been there, but I have not. But I have seen the pictures where you have a great big pyramid of champagne glasses, and they're all balanced on one another. And then, of course, if you're at that sort of party, you've got plenty of champagne. But let's think it's a Methodist one, all right? So we got water. And, <laughs> all right. Now, come on. We're more lively than that now. We've got fizzy water, right? <laughs> and you pour it in the top one and it works its way down. It dribbles out into the next one. You know, so you've got this complete waterfall. This is how Jesus is, you see. He gives the new heart water and that trickles through. You will all be small fountain. <laughs> so that Jesus stands within you, with, amongst you, in your unity, giving life and the spirit to this togetherness which you could never have had before, which is sustainable, which is a love which, after the, after the, um, the, the, the people in Manchester, you know, the sort of traffic people are back to normal and they've got to sell flowers and not give them away again and, and people aren't being nice anymore. This is sustained through the spirit, a unity, 
a koinonia, a oneness that the spirit running through people, all people, all those people standing together and yet there is a fountain of life in their hearts which is more than just being together. It is the body of Christ. It gives life, it gives life to your shared history. Who brought you out of Egypt? I brought you out of Egypt. Great is thy faithfulness, not haven't we been through it together, that the Lord brings us through. And that the spirit that is an inner fountain brings all of these good things and makes them better and gives them life, gives resurrection that we were hoping for. That the person kneeling on the pavement with the candle is met by Jesus who reaches into them and changes them. And so this morning we need that in our own hearts. We need that possibly in our conversations when people go on to us. We need that in our prayers. We need to perhaps not just pray for people, but pray with people. We need the spirit in our hearts to change us from the inside and to give us that spark of resurrection. In our communion this morning, Banner is just going to come and sort of zell there. In In our communion this morning, we remember that in... that it is a no hope case, really, with crucifixion. He dies and that's it. But it's not. We celebrate resurrection again and again and again.